Et là, on m'entend euh, correct pas... Ok, très bien. Je te préviens, 5 minutes avant Oui. 25 minutes. 25, ok, très bien. Ah oui, oui. Ok, thanks. So, um, good morning, everybody. So, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers to talk about some uh, results I have obtained uh, with the Spectro and Dynamics group in the ICB lab in the uh, University of Burgundy in Dijon, and also results that I have obtained uh, before in the Institut Physique de Rennes and the uh, University of Waterloo. Yeah. So it's all about uh, dynamics in diode media, and in particular, I will talk about quantum clusters and molecular encounters, typically collisions, and how may artificial intelligence help uh, circuit robots that use a, a bypass bottlenecks. So it will be into two parts. So the first part deal with the uh, dynamics in uh, quantum field environments, and the second part with uh, reactive scattering in gas phase. And you'll see the details timing. So let's start with the first part. So as you probably know, the helium droplets or hydrogen clusters environment are very useful for uh, isolation spectroscopy of uh, transient spaces like uh, electronic excited atoms or molecules or even ions. And in fact, the objective is twofold when using that, that kind of uh, core clusters. Is their role as a cryogenic matrix for the spectroscopic study of these transient species, so without perturbation or with very few perturbation. And the other, the other thing is uh, to probe the superfluidity, like, like a bucket experiment for microscopic superfluid, but at the molecular level. So we can use dopants as probe for superfluidity. And the ultimate goal, of course, is the control of chemical reactions by the environment. So when we study theoretically these kind of uh, systems, there are methods of choice, which are quantum Monte Carlo methods. So I present two here. The first one is diffusion Monte Carlo or DMC. And the second one is a path integral Monte Carlo. So for DMC, you start with the time dependent Schrodinger equation. You transform into imaginary time and you obtain a kind of heat equation or diffusion equation. And as you know, the heat equation, it's very uh, easy, not, not easy, but it's adapted to solve it with a, a stochastic solutions so or a random work in continuous in space. And typically it gives, as you lose the time dependency, it gives structural properties and energetics of clusters, okay? So in, we have to take all these limits. So the, the time has to go to infinity, the number of workers also, and we have to compensate for the finite time step size. The other method, we work at finite temperature. So the original idea of Feynman to uh, express um, evolution, time dependent evolution operator as a path integral in real time, we transfer it to the density operator. So we express the density operator at the path integral in thermal imaginary time. So we can show that, in fact, a quantum system of helium or hydrogen clusters is equivalent to a kind of classical system of polymer chains with the adapted potential. So I give an example here where we use both methods to model uh, excited rubidium in helium environment. So this is the potential. The approximation is that it decomposes into a sum of pair potential for heliums and the excited rubidium with uh, several helium. So the inputs here are pair potentials for excited rubidium and helium and helium-helium pairs. The spin orbit is 
included phenomenologically. Uh, this is the spin orbit of rubidium. And for the analytic form of the surface, we use the diatomic molecule method. We also use a tri wave function, which is a kind of product form of uh, fractals of our rubidium and perium of Fermi and Jastro types. And we have parameters to optimize generally using a variational Monte Carlo. So yeah, some results, typical results of this study. So you have radial distribution. Uh, so the, the, the distribution between the uh, exactly rubidium and helium, when we have two, three, six, seven helium. So we see a single peak, which increases. The maximum is at seven helium. And then when you obtain eight helium, you have a secondary peak. So it's an indication of another solvation shell. But we don't have information about the geometry of the shells here, so we can plot also angular distribution. So you see that for very few helium, this is very floppy, and it uh, begins to, to be rigid at uh, beginning at six helium, and the maximum of the rigidity is marked with minima equals zero between the strong maxima for seven helium. So it's an indication of a ring, a region ring with seven helium atoms. So it looks like this, the rubidium in the middle, it's sided like a kind of pure detour here with seven helium atoms around. And we can show that the system is planar. And when we had a half helium, it starts another shell outside. So what are the lots for this kind of studies? First of all, the accuracy of the potential. So it's not very accurate here because it's the GIM method. We can do better. Uh, the dimensionality, it's always a problem if we increase the number of helium atoms and the form of the guiding wave function, the tri wave function. So, where machine learning can bring uh, possible uh, amelioration is for the regression, so a better fitting model. So, it will be supervised machine learning and maybe the use of quantum kernel in the future. I mentioned the, the talk by uh, Roman Krems about that last week. Uh, dimension reduction. So it's not a kind, it's unsupervised machine learning for this kind of stuff. And the script to, to uh, have a, a reliable optimization of the parameters of the gating function. So it's another example with uh, rotational sampling. So it's, it's a rubidium dimer uh, in helium environment. So you see the Hamiltonian with a diffusion coefficient, and here you have it identifies for rotational degree of freedom with the rotational constant. The interaction potential is again sum of helium helium pairs interactions and the potential energy surface for a three body system, there will be two helium, which is here. So it's a typical van der Waals complex with a T shape. Uh, T-shape uh, minimum here, and a very shallow well, very, very shallow of mine 2.6 wave angles. So let's see some results. So as you see, I just go back to the potential, just with this information, I, this is uh, smaller than the helium medium interaction. So we can expect that the helium group together and push aside the rubidium. And indeed, that's what we observe here. So with a firm surface of helium, you see that the helium is on the surface. So it makes a dimple. So uh, one rubidium, one rubidium, the middle. So in the middle, uh, you have helium density around the waist of the rubidium dimer, but not enough so that it gets uh, solvated. So it stays on the surface. And here you have the quarter of the dimple with he uh, different helium layers. We can extract also dynamical information so if we plot the imaginary time correlation function, we see that it fixed the exact free planar rotor. So it's free rotation on the surface, plus a kind of pendular motion. So it's a combination of its two motion on the surface of the droplet. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about a hydrogen cluster. So it's para hydrogen. So the code is Moritz PIMC that we, uh, uh, it was when I was in the University of Waterloo that we released it. 
So this is a methodology for path integral Monte Carlo. The important thing is, is a total factorization that I learned last week also, it can be optimized by a quantum computing method. So in the talk of Ismailov and last week also. Um, so now, <clears throat> a big bottleneck is to compute a, a density estimator for rotational sampling here and the associated energy estimator. So also we have a, a bosonic solvent. So we have to take into account of the exchange between bosons. This is done with the worm algorithm uh, originated by Baninsegi et al. So let's see some results. So for a fixed water, you have uh, isocadron core of hydrogen, like if water was another hydrogen and it grows uh, slowly. So you can differentiate the different hydrogen. And when you put into account the water rotation, you see that you have uh, rings that form. So you cannot enumerate all the uh, hydrogen between three distinct rings. And if you push up the temperature, you have also rings, but you lose the superfluid character. So superfluid character is a response property, is, that comp is linked with the exchange between hydrogen, but you have to properly estimate the superfluid fraction by constructing a proper uh, superfluid estimator. <coughs> so the logs here are the rotational sampling efficiency and the accurate determination of superfluid fraction. And what, what machine learning could contribute is to guess a high, high J rotational density estimation, and maybe construct other class of superfluidity estimators. Another solution mentioned here is uh, the construction of approximate uh, density and energy estimators. So you see that generally they are constructed as sum of a states. So it's an example for the rotational density of a linear rotor. And here, another example for an asymmetric top. So it becomes very intricate. So we want to think about a procedure to simplify this. So how can we do that? It's to put the constraints of the rotor after quantization. So for a classical mechanics simulation, this is how you express observables with that and with constraints. And the question is, for a, can we do the same for a quantum system with a classical quantum isomorphism of Chandler? So yes, it's possible. In fact, we can put the constraint directly on the bid after quantization. The cost is a shift in the total energy that we obtain. Uh, so, okay, see, this is a general expression for a complex system in quantum mechanics, but I, I won't go longer on this. The procedure is here. So there are two ways to complex, to, to, sorry, to quantize a complex system. The general way is to include constraints first, then you do the quantization, but you can be uh, led to very great difficulties in, in doing that when you, you we do it when you do the quantization on a, on a curve manifold. The other way is to quantize in Cartesian coordinates, which is always doable, and you put the constraint after. And this is what we do here on the density matrix. And then we obtain what we call the post quantization constraint operator, and we can derive the associated, associated energy estimator. A very simple example with the model potential at 0.37 Kelvin. You have the typical quadratic convergence of the sum of a state propagator here from below. And here, the linear convergence from above to the same value of the uh, post quantization constraint operator. So it works, it works well, but you have to think of shift in energy. So the only system that it's an exception where there is uh, exact convergence is a sphere. For other manifolds like SO2 or SO3, there are always a, a shift in energy when you estimate, uh, when you compute the energy from the approximated density matrix. So you have to correct it. So let's see gas phase processes. 
So we'll talk now about the problem of ozone formation in the atmosphere, so something completely else. So it comes mainly from a reaction, which is a three-body reaction. So oxygen atom plus O2 plus M. So you need M to carry away the excess energy. And it's extremely difficult to treat fully quantum mechanically. So we have to make some approximation. So uh, a very well-known mechanism proposed by Lederman is a first step, you form rotationally excited species or three, we can dissociate back. And the uh, second step is a stabilization step. So in fact, the lifetime of the intermediate is very important in, in a sense, the full exchange reaction O plus O2, which has the O3 star state as an intermediate and give back O2 plus O competes with the stabilization, stabilization step. <clears throat> So we need a potential energy surface for ozone. So ozone is not an easy system to treat on the electron structure point of view. So it's very uh, highly multi-configurational. So we need an MRCI method with an accurate long, long range path for collision. And you see here, you have a three equivalent minima so it can reduce the computation cost. So here is an example of one of the most accurate potential computed by the group of two TRF here. So, so the well depth is 1.1 EV about, and it reproduces very well the uh, experiment in spectroscopy in uh, ring cavity experiments, a very sensitive spectroscopy. So it has probably is good also for collision. So let's see, we, we use the um, time independent quantum mechanics Formalism. So we start with the Schrodinger independent, uh, time independent Schrodinger equations. We write the Hamiltonian in hyperspherical coordinates, the one by uh, Smith Witten. So they are adapted to the uh, uh, inertial axis of the complex. And we define a basis and we are led, uh, as you know, to the famous closed coupled equations, the radial equations. <coughs> And these equations we uh, propagate with the log derivative propagator. So we use the IP3D code uh, originally written by Jean Michel Lonnet at the end of the 90s. And we can express the cross sections with T matrix elements and the rate constants. <coughs> so, one result it's a thermal rate constant for the exchange reaction with isotope 18O and 16O, 16O uh, dioxygen. So you have the experiments from the group of Janssen with the error bars. So dash line here is previous results with uh, another potential and in also in wave packet calculation. And these are the new results with a two terra potential, the black solid line here. So we see that we have quantitative agreement now, uh, uh, thanks to this potential. And we have shown that the, the topology of the trans transition state, the topography of the transition state uh, is very important for this kind of reaction. The last thing we can do is compute the lifetimes. So the lifetime of the complex, I said it, they were very important for the stabilization process. So we use a Smith formalism the Smith, form is, uh, the Smith formalism is the Q matrix. So it's computed from the energy derivative of the S matrix. And it, so in order to not to lose much accuracy, what we do is to propagate uh, the log derivative with the energy derivative of the log derivative itself alongside. So we obtain at the end of, at the, end of, the, of the day, the so energy derivative of the K matrix and also on the, of the S matrix. So it's a way to try not to lose uh, a curious. <clears throat> so here, a uh, schematic view from Babikov. So this is an entrance channel with 18O and 16, 16O and the exit, exit channel here, uh, isotopic substitution here. 
So you have a entrance ZPE and the exit ZPE, and the difference between the two is called the delta ZPE. So the red line here, and above you have all the metals, the, all the meta, meta, metastable species of excited ozone, and in the bottom stable ozone. So the red line here is done vertical here. So it's the energy range of the delta ZPE. So what we see for different values of uh, capital J, at the beginning, you have few resonances and all located in the delta ZP region. And when you increase J, they become more and more dense, but still located. And if you still increase the J until J equals five, you see that the density is increasing also, and you have resonances occurring outside the delta ZP range. So let's go further. We increase again, so J equals eight, nine, 10. So we see a forest of resonance. So it's very easy to miss one. So that's where, so that's why we use this procedure. And if we go until 20, 30 or more, what you see is that the average is still higher than a typical collision term given by this expression. So in fact, the trace of the Q, mat Q matrix gives the average time delay, and it can be connected by this formula to the density of rotational state, rotational states. Okay. And you have lifetimes reaching uh, 100 nanoseconds for high J values. Last topic, I will talk about the problem that arises when we have identical nuclei in collisions. So, if we neglect the very tiny spin dependent uh, term in the Hamiltonian, so if we treat collision at not too low energies, we can factor out the wave function at this, an electronic port, a nuclear space port, describe the nuclear motion, and a nuclear spin port. And we will see that the spin symmetry here will restrict by the Pauli principle, the space symmetry, and it has a repercussion on observables and particularly cross sections. So a collision with three identical nuclei, X plus X2, you have only one final arrangement. This S is a spin of the nuclei, so this is the total number of spin states. And the group under consideration is a S3 permutation group. Okay, so this is the character table. So like for two nuclei, we'll have, of course, the two uh, one-dimensional representation, A1 and A2. And the important representation, which uh, for the possibility of auto power conversion, as we will see, is the last one, the two-dimensional E representation. We can distinguish two kinds of process, the full elastic process, or these two alternatives are indistinguishable in quantum mechanics, the so pure elastic and the rearranging because we cannot distinguish them. And the same for non-elastic process. So it's the same way we can have V and J that can be different from the initial state. A single example I will give you with the uh, triple seven collision, so 17O with 17O, 70O uh, deoxygen. So the spin of this nuclei is five half, and we can write the nuclear space wave function according to the representation of the S3 permutation group that I described here. We have restriction. If we start with the auto molecule, the A2 representation is forbidden asymptotically, so it reduces to Two components, and the same if we start with the para diatom, there is an A1 for the uh, representation that is for the homocentrically, and we reduce to that. So, for non zero spin collision, we have possibility of auto para transitions, and in general, the cross sections are given by this formula, and the fraction here are the spin weights of the cross section. So, how we compute this spin weight? We can work in fully uncoupled representation. To me, this is a simple, the simplest view. So we write the space as a double, double tensor product. 
we count all the spin functions and we decompose this tensor product over the uh, the subspace of the, the representation spaces of the collision uh, under the parametration F3 group. So you have the completely symmetric one, completely anti-symmetric one, and the two modules here are of mixed symmetry. And then from each of this representation, you don't need the precise form of the spin function, you just have to count them. So you count them with uh, simple combinatorics and you obtain the weight for the spin, the, the spin weight for the cross sections. So here are some results of auto power transitions. So here I start with a seven plus auto seven seven to give para seven seven. So it's an auto power conversion. Here I start with para seven seven and I go to auto seven seven. So here we see that the green curve here is uh, it has no threshold, but it dominates all the the the, 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 the cross section dominates for all collision energy. So, so this is uh, this is atypical because we, we should have expected that the red line uh, to zero dominates. Okay, Monsieur Finicazi. And a last result. Uh, when I just show you an illustration for the for the use of spin rate cross section, so here again I start with seven plus auto seven seven, which can give auto again. So this is the elastic process of para, so the OP process or O process, and you compute the cross section using the spin rate that I presented you in the previous slide. And you can do the same ways, uh, starting with para uh, seven seven diatoms, which can give again para. So this is a PP cross section or auto the PO cross section. What we can uh, retain is that sometimes at low energy, the the auto conversion or uh, the auto para conversion or para auto conversion process can be bigger than the non elastic process. So it's not negligible at all. Okay, so what are the logs here for lifetimes and identical nuclei? The main is the computation cost for lifetimes. It's very demanding to go to high, uh, high values of J. We have the possibility of missing resonances and the assignment problem. And how these resonances are really involved in the three body ozone formation. This is not easy to, 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 to see. And the, the, the big bottleneck is, is a high dimensional PES for the full process and, and to find a quantum method to treat this kind of process. Also, uh, for identical nuclei, a typical reaction that would be nice to treat in an in in uh, accurate and rigorous way with, will be the H2 plus H2 plus of strong chemical interest with numerous pattern changes with the possibility also of auto para conversion for both H2 and H3 plus. So what machine learning and quantum computing could bring? Uh, maybe a guess of the density of relation of the metastable states because we see it's very dense, it's a forest. So why not train uh, neural networks to guess the evolution. And uh, quantum computing could bring a spinning up of the algorithm of the two metrics. And also we have still have the problem of dimensional reduction for the four or three plus MPS, even if M is an argon atom. Okay. Okay, so I want to thank my uh, collaborators. Pascal Onvo, Erwan Kriva, Maxon Pepers, Alco Par, Richard Oz, Romain Pensioner, Vladimir Tuterev, Pierre Nicolas Roy in Canada, Toby Zeng, Marc Leno, Axel Ravel in Ben, Robert Zivic in, and Thierry Stoklin. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Yes. Voilà. <laughs> 
Thank you, Grégoire. How many partial waves do you have for computing uh, O plus O2 at 100 kelvins, I, I guess? Uh, or how many? One, one, 119. 119? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this is without nuclear spin, right? Or with uh, the, the spin, is it? Uh... No, uh, with the spin, it's we are restricted to lower energies. Okay. So we have less. Okay. Okay. Yes. But and for the four ozone rate, that is the yeah. 8 plus 66, six, yes, it goes nearly 200. Okay, rate. and it's not too demanding on the. It computer? is very demanding. It is very demanding. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thierry. <laughs> uh, well, that was a very nice talk, and uh, that was interesting to see also uh, where uh, machine learning and uh, quantum computing could. Uh, yeah. Uh, be interesting. Uh, I wonder, in fact, uh, what are the vibrational frequencies of the O3 complex? Uh, so the frequencies, I don't remember exactly, uh, but probably you have the asymmetric mode, which is the highest, and then the stretching symmetric. And, and some bendings, but the frequency uh, precisely, I don't remember. Okay, no, because uh, uh, following the question of Boulven, yes, uh, that was uh, how many vibrational level you you can couple inside the well. Yes, and uh, that, that was my just my question, and also the, the rotational constant is not. No, it's it's small. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, and you say only 190 uh, partial waves. Partial waves. Uh, yeah, but we, we, we are not going so high in, in collision energy, okay. in fact. Uh, because, yes, after that, it becomes very, and uh, if you increase too much the number of partial waves, you can have problem, problems in the Bessel functions. Uh, you can, we, we, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it, it, can be, uh, it, it can be tricky. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, no, I, not, not really. I don't. Uh, yes, but uh, but still, it's reactive. So if if it if it if it uh, were uh, in uh, elastic scattering, of course, we would need a lot of lot of partial waves. But no, uh, two hundred is enough for this uh, energy collision range and these temperatures. And. Uh, uh, yes, just another question. It is using the lifetime ah. uh, matrix uh, yes. eigenvalues. Yes. So it's when it is a just a threshold. Uh, and, and it is uh, the time. It's Eisenberg. Uh, uh, only Eisenberg. Uh, so and, and when we reach this threshold, it says uh, in a first approximation, uh, I would say yes, but probably there is a more um, yes. You see this threshold in gray. Yes. So generally, no. It it has to be uh, a certain amount. I don't remember exact how 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 much uh, a certain amount above the, the threshold. But this is the criterion. So, but I, I'm very aware that we can miss, even with this algorithm, the way, the way to count resonances. This is graphical, so we still can uh, miss resonances. A, a proper way would be to count them using a kind of uh, uh, Levinson theorem or, or something like that, yes. Thank you very much, Grégoire. I suggest you keep uh, talking at the coffee break, <laughs> since you're both here. And we have coffee break now. Up to what time? We're a little bit delayed.